Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Richard Wills? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. In 2002, Richard Wills was a traffic officer with the Toronto Police Service in Ontario, Canada. He had been in that position for almost 25 years. He was active in real estate investment and had a net worth well over a million dollars. Richard lived in a house by himself in Richmond Hill, Ontario. He was married, but he had been separated from his wife, Joanne, since June 2001. Richard and his wife had once been business partners with a couple, Lavinia Mariani and her husband Dominic. Lavinia went by the name Linda. The group had owned a power skating school in Newmarket. Richard and Linda had been romantically involved for at least six years. This was disturbing to Linda's friends, who were aware of the infidelity. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Factor. Power up for springtime with America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. Get nutritious, chef-prepared meals delivered straight to your door, leaving you time and energy to tackle everything on your to-do list. Look and feel your best in time for warmer weather with calorie-smart meals around 550 calories or less. Want to cut back on takeout? Get Factor instead. Not only is Factor cheaper than takeout, but meals are ready faster than restaurant delivery. In just two minutes, put the time and money you save toward planning activities for when the weather warms up. Factor chef prepared meals make it easy to eat well, so you never have to opt for something that isn't good for you. Registered dietitians at Factor work hand in hand with their kitchen to ensure every meal is made from scratch with nutritious ingredients. Factor is ideal for my busy lifestyle because it saves me time going to the grocery store and cooking. Factor helps me to stay productive. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code Dr. Grande50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's 50% off your first box at factor75.com, code Dr. Grande 50. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 15, 2002, Linda went missing. She was last seen on that day at Richard's house. It didn't take long for the police to speak to Richard. They visited his house on February 17. His behavior was peculiar. For example, he was crying uncontrollably and removed his clothing so the police could see that he wasn't injured. They had not asked him to remove his clothing. When he reached for his underwear, the police told him to stop. Richard admitted that he was romantically involved with Linda, but he denied any criminal activity. He agreed to allow the police to search his vehicle and his residence, but they didn't find anything. Richard acted as though he was quite concerned about Linda's welfare. He even left messages on her business voicemail. His first call contained kissing noises. He told the police that he believed that Linda's husband, Dominic, could have been involved in her disappearance. In March 2002, Richard legally separated from his wife and agreed to pay her spousal support and child support, as well as a one-time payment of $120,000. On June 4, through both cash and property transfers, he paid his wife more than what was specified in their agreement. He said he was trying to make things right because he had coerced her into signing her interest in a property over to him. On June 5, Richard and his lawyer visited the police station and provided officers with an unbelievable story about Linda's disappearance. Here's what Richard told investigators. At some point during their affair, Linda informed Richard that when she died, she did not want to be buried in the mausoleum of her husband's family. Richard promised her that he would bury her at his family cottage. Essentially, Richard and Linda had a deal about what would happen when she died. It was a love pact between the couple. Richard then talked about a tragic accident that occurred at his house. Linda was visiting when she fell backward off the stairs and hit her head on a ceramic tile floor. Richard immediately remembered his promise about burying her. Therefore, he put her body in a garbage container behind a fake wall in his basement. This was not the intended final resting place. He was just keeping her body there until he could bury her according to 
their love pact. He would have buried her right away, but the ground was too cold, and the police were buzzing around, asking questions. Richard told the police that he pulled the garbage container out from behind the fake wall so they could find it. The police searched Richard's house and, of course, found the garbage container. They noticed that it was sealed quite effectively. Richard had used duct tape, caulk, liquid adhesive, a clear plastic tarp, and a number of bolts to secure the container. He also wrapped the container in blankets and bedspreads. It appears as though whatever was in the container was supposed to be there for a while. When the police opened the garbage container, they found Linda's body. She had a rope around her neck, and an aluminum baseball bat was beside her. In addition to these items, the police found her purse, identification, cell phone, pager, and men's clothing she had purchased three days before disappearing. A forensic pathologist believed that Linda died from blunt force injury and possible asphyxia, but there was no way to be certain due to the advanced state of decomposition. Richard was charged with second-degree murder, but later he would get an upgrade to first-degree murder. Over the next 15 months, Richard transferred assets to his wife, sister, and children. He put himself in a position where he didn't have enough money for his legal defense. Richard initially paid for his attorneys, but then fired them and wanted the government to pay for his defense. When he approached legal aid, they told him they would pay, but he had to agree to a repayment plan. He refused and was not given assistance. In 2004, Richard represented himself at a preliminary hearing. He did his best to delay the proceedings. For example, he planned on calling 20 witnesses, and he cross-examined one police officer for nine days. On day 65, Richard still had four more witnesses left. The attorney general brought the hearing to a close and invoked a rarely used power to indict without an order from a judge. The judge advised Richard to apply again for legal aid, Richard did that and was once again rejected because he would not agree to any type of repayment plan. The judge finally approved funding so that Richard would be represented, partially based on the reality that Richard would alienate the jury and not have a fair trial. It appeared as though Richard's bad behavior was paying off. His representation would be covered by the government. Richard managed to drag out the pretrial court proceedings for 144 days before finally getting to his trial for murder. The trial lasted for 84 days, finally ending on October 31, 2007, when Richard was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He was initially incarcerated in the same prison that housed Paul Bernardo and Russell Williams. They were in the same unit with him. Richard was transferred after annoying staff and inmates, including Paul and Russell. Apparently, Richard demonstrated a lack of hygiene and would spend all night singing. Richard was transferred out of that prison to one in British Columbia in 2012. He could be released as early as 2027. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. There's really no question that Richard was guilty of first-degree murder. He confessed to a friend that he committed the murder, he admitted that Linda died in his house, and he admitted that he disposed of her body. Richard purchased the garbage container, the tarp, and the caulk that he used for the body disposal eight days before Linda died. Richard claimed that Linda's death was an accident. He said they were engaging in a yearly ritual they referred to as Valentine's Week, where they would buy cheap gifts for each other. Richard placed a ceramic bear that he purchased at Walmart near the top of his staircase. When Linda went to pick up the bear, she fell backward and eventually hit her head on the floor. Richard said that the reason Linda fell was because she was upset with his wife, Joanne. I guess even the prospect of possessing a ceramic bear could not distract her from her hatred of his wife. Richard's story is very difficult to believe. I think what really happened here was that Linda wanted to break up with Richard. In order for Richard and Linda to be together, they each had to leave their respective spouses. Richard left his wife, and Linda was supposed to leave her husband, but she broke the deal. Richard engaged in demanding and manipulative behavior, but was unable to control Linda, therefore he murdered her. Item number two. During Richard's various court proceedings, 
He was represented by 13 different attorneys. He paid about $70,000 for his representation in the beginning. After the government took over, they paid over $1.5 million. He managed to move his money to his relatives and shield it from the government. Richard's case prompted calls to reform the legal aid system in Ontario. He clearly took advantage of the government and wasted public money, but it wasn't just wasting money that attracted attention to Richard's case. It was his behavior in court as well. Which brings me to item number three. During the court proceedings, Richard was disruptive and dramatic. Here are just a few examples of his outrageous and shameless behavior. Richard intimidated his own attorneys. He repeatedly insulted everyone around him, including witnesses, judges, and lawyers. He claimed that he had rights that he did not actually possess. He was manipulative, deceptive, condescending, and arrogant. He would often go on extended monologues, but never actually reach a meaningful conclusion or prove anything. Richard accused the police of beating him and demanded to go to the hospital. When his request was denied, he closed his eyes and slumped forward as if he was dying right there in court. He routinely expelled gas from two different orifices. He urinated in a police cruiser several times and even defecated in court. He proudly showed the court his delivery. Richard was removed from the court several times to a room where he could monitor the proceedings on video. Item number four, Richard did not do himself any favors in court as far as convincing the jury. He was on the stand for five days describing in detail a number of mundane events that had nothing to do with his case. Sometimes he talked about himself in the third person. Richard compared himself to the TV character MacGyver. This character is known for taking ordinary items and making complex machines and accomplishing impressive tasks with them. So Richard was saying that he was crafty, intelligent, and resourceful, like MacGyver. He said that the fact that the garbage container was only bolted on three sides proved that it was temporary, because as a thorough individual, he would have bolted it on four sides if it was permanent. Richard described how he agonized over his decision between two types of caulk to seal the garbage container. He told the jury about how he was thrifty and had found a great deal on the garbage container, the ceramic bear, and the aluminum baseball bat. He had used the baseball bat to threaten teenagers in his neighborhood and therefore had a lot of great memories with the bat. When Richard finally described Linda's death, he supplied morbid details and showed no empathy. For example, he complained about how difficult it was to shove her body into the 60-gallon garbage container. To explain his body disposal efforts after realizing she did not survive the fall, Richard said, but I had to do what I had to do. She was dead. Richard insisted that sexually explicit voice messages from Linda to him were played for the jury, I suppose to prove that she loved him. When the messages were being played, Richard would gaze at the ceiling as if toward Linda in heaven and blow his nose repeatedly in an obnoxious manner. Item number five, Richard was given a mental health evaluation to determine if he knew the difference between right and wrong. The mental health clinician made a few observations about Richard. For example, Richard spoke in a way that appeared to be rehearsed and scripted. He asked the clinician to write down what he said verbatim. He offered vague and incomplete accounts when questioned and frequently went on tangents. Richard infringed on the personal space of the clinician He bragged about how he's performing better than his attorneys in court. Richard claimed to have mental health symptoms, like having two or three personalities, hearing voices, having buzzing noises in his head, poor concentration, and memory problems. The clinician believed that Richard was malingering. The only diagnosis given was narcissistic personality disorder, which is characterized by several symptoms, including grandiosity, overinvestment in fantasy, envy, a sense of entitlement, requiring admiration, and having a lack of empathy. Moving to my final item, number six, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Richard had several characteristics from grandiose narcissism, but he also had a few vulnerable traits, like being resentful and vindictive. When Linda would not agree to divorce her husband, Richard became obsessed with revenge. She had broken the deal, and he couldn't stand it. He murdered Linda out of vindictiveness and stored her body in his house 
to display his dominance. He wanted to be reminded that he was victorious. Richard was lazy and highly influenced by his emotions. He became obsessed with concerns about being caught, therefore turned himself in, hoping the police would believe his lie about Linda dying accidentally. He had somehow convinced himself that the police would give him a break because he was a low-ranking traffic officer, like he was one of them. He specifically mentioned the term brotherhood of police officers about 30 times when talking to investigators. He offered to pay investigators back for any assistance by saying, quote, whatever you do for me, I'll do for you tenfold, unquote. Without empathy, Richard was unable to successfully deceive people about his guilt, but he was able to manipulate the criminal justice system into paying for his defense. Here's how the case of Richard Wills could be summarized. A basic badge with a bankroll became a boastful but beleaguered benefactor of a bewitching and bewildering beauty who barked at binding herself to him. Being bitter about it, he beat her with a baseball bat and buried her body behind a barrier in his basement. Bold and brazen, he believed that he could bamboozle. Therefore, he blabbed to the police about the body's burial spot. He bombarded the legal system with a barrage of boisterous behavior, bellowing, and bodily functions like belching, bowel movements, and backfiring until he was finally banished. Those are my thoughts in the case of Richard Wills. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.